Morning, church. <clears throat> I'm glad y'all made it out today. You know, could have easily just stayed home. It's windy, real windy. It's cold. It's rainy. And that's not a knock to who's not here. I get it. If, if you know, something, something serious came up, you know, like a tree fell on your house or whatnot, you know, then you're not here, you know. But uh, I couldn't help but hear that line in that song as it said when when I was your foe still your love fought for me think about that for a minute you know when when we were at enmity with God when we were enemies with him when we had no desire we had no craving we had no longing to want him in our lives to want to obey him to want to submit to want to be part of his kingdom When we were the exact opposite, when we were doing our own thing, when we were the king of our kingdom, still his love fought for us. That that's that's amazing. That's a mystery of God that I'll never be able to understand. But I'm so grateful that his love is that deep that he would love me despite my waywardness. We need encouragement today, church. I love Romans chapter 15, uh, verse 13, and that's encouragement. It reads, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. Today, what are you filled with? What are you filled with? Be honest with yourself. I pray that you're filled with with, with with love and joy and peace and believing. But I don't know, because I'm not you. Are you filled with doubt today? Does doubt fill your mind and your heart? Doubting the circumstances, doubting the situation? Are you filled with despair because your circumstances look a certain way? Are you, are you filled with anxiousness? Anxious about all that's going on? Oh, taxes are coming up. I don't know what I'm going to do. Well, the good news is, church, today, right now, you can be filled instead with joy, peace, and believing in Christ Jesus. You can, by the power of the Holy Spirit imputed to you, abound in hope that can be you today you don't have to wait till you get to heaven to have hope but we must be intentional you have to be intentional i have to be intentional with what we focus our attention and our energy on i say this every week and i got nothing else to say because this is biblical if, if, if we're not in the word, then we're not going to abound in hope. Because what are we filled with? You can't be filled with, with Ken Jennings and, 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 and Jeopardy. <laughs> you can't be filled with, with all the other stuff. And I'm, there's nothing wrong with Ken Jennings. There's nothing wrong with Jeopardy. It is what it is. But what I'm saying is you cannot fill yourself. It's like food. You can't fill yourself on Krispy Kremes and wonder why you're out of shape and overweight. Because you don't are not diligent. It's nothing wrong with having a Krispy Kreme. Nothing wrong with having a couple Krispy Kreme donuts. But manage what you're doing. Be intentional with what you're doing. We, we do it with our bodies, right? Going on keto diets and this and that and that. But when it comes to spiritual things, I think sometimes we think God's just going to shower down blessings upon blessings and, he, and, and we're just not going to do nothing. And that's not how it works, church. You have to put in the work. If anyone told you that you're just going to be blessed... And that's it. That was a lie. (laughs) That's not true biblical Christianity. Look in the Old and the New Testament. It's all there, man. People had to do stuff. That's why I love Jacob. Jacob contended for the faith. The Bible says violent men will seize the kingdom of heaven by force. What does that mean? We have to understand and have revelation of the Holy Spirit. It means he was intentional. Intentional people are going to seize the kingdom of heaven. They're going to say, I don't care if I don't want to do it. I'm going to get in the word this morning. I don't care if I don't want to do it. I'm going to get on my knees and I'm going to praise God. Eric just said, you know, we're talking about uh, CPR. I had a CPR training yesterday I had to go to. And, you know, he's talking about, you know, a while ago when he had a training. And and the teacher said, what do you do when nothing else works and everything else fails? Nobody else said nothing. He said, pray. (laughs) 
You don't come to that conclusion unless you're intentional with, with, with your thinking and, 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 and with what you believe. So, church, I want to encourage you today. May we look to God, the God of all creation, the God of Israel. For all hope. So that each and every day of our lives, we can be filled with this hope. Amen. Amen. He who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit has to say to the churches. Uh, This morning, we will be in Ecclesiastes chapter eight. We're wrapping up this chapter today. We'll be looking at verses 14 down through 17. This message is entitled, Man Cannot Know God's Ways. What a trip. Man cannot know God's ways. All right. So when you get there, if you could please stand for the reading of God's word. We got plenty of Bibles in the back. We got ESVs. We got New King James. Got the, you know, scripture on the screen. If you'd like to follow along, that way you could do it. Bust out your phone. I'm not tripping. But either way, get yourself to Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verse 14 through 17 for your own benefit. And then uh, we'll go ahead and read our text this morning. I'll pray and then we'll get into the heart of our message this morning. So starting in verse 14, and it reads, There is a vanity that takes place on earth, that there are righteous people to whom it happens according to the deeds of the wicked. And there are wicked people to whom it happens according to the deeds of the righteous. I said that this also is vanity. And I commend joy for men has nothing better under the sun but to eat and drink and be joyful. For this will go well with him in his toil through the days of his life that God has given him under the sun. When I applied my heart to know wisdom and to see the business that is done on earth, how neither day nor night do one's eyes see sleep. Then I saw all the work of God that man cannot find out the work that is done under the sun. However, much man may toil in seeking, he will not find it out. Even though a wise man claims to know, he cannot find it out. Let's go ahead and pray. Lord, we need your revelation. We just praise you for your goodness and your faithfulness to us. Thank you so much for your son, Jesus, the Messiah, the one who you've given that we could be reconciled to you. Lord, we need, uh, again, revelation, wisdom. We need your anointing, your favor, so that we could understand and rightfully divide your word. Uh, Unbeknownst to just the common person, this would sound like a riddle. And, and they wouldn't understand it, Lord. So we, we need you, you to illumine our minds and our hearts and our spirits so that we can understand and rightfully divide this word. Show us where uh, Christ is in it. Show us where this applies to us. And may we have ears uh, to be attentive. Would you open up the eyes of our hearts, our innermost beings, that we would, uh, you know, really dig into your word this morning and get what we need to get out of it. I pray you bless your people. Thank you for drawing them to you, to your house. And may uh, you be blessed uh, in all that's done and said this morning. We thank you and love you. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Uh, yeah, it's very true. <laughs> and and, and I'll, I'll just share this real quick. I You know, I, I shared it with the men uh, the other day and it might seem silly and it might seem stupid, but, but I, you need, I need to be transparent. And, um, you know, as we've been going through this book and, you know, vanity of vanities, all life is vanity. And, you know, and, and I'm believing, I'm understanding what the Lord is showing me and, and, you know, week in, week out studying and, and being immersed in the word. But somewhere along the line, I got caught up and I got sidetracked, <laughs> I got sidetracked with something silly. I got sidetracked with my hair. <laughs> a hairdo. A while back, I was talking about waves and, 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 you know, all this and that. And there's nothing wrong with that. But it became something that was time consuming. And, and, and I made an idol out of it. And I'm over here brushing my hair and brushing my hair. And, you know, I was doing other things. But the other day, I, I just got really convicted. And the Lord was just like, you need to stop. But the cool thing about it was... Even though I had to repent and even though I had to get right, I had to repent to my wife. I had to repent to my kids and ask them for forgiveness. Kids didn't even know what I was talking about. But nonetheless, I had to get right with them and and tell them, I'm sorry that I wasn't I haven't been fully present. I'm over here, you know, playing with you. I'm brushing my hair. (laughs) What in the world, man? 
And the Lord's just like, look, man, vanity of vanity. He's like, you of all people, you should have seen this, man. You should have seen this coming. Like, this is vanity. You know, spending so much time being consumed and being concerned with your outer exterior and what you look like. It's not worth it. So I'm just I'm just being transparent with you, church. I'm letting you know your pastor struggles with all these same things. I'm not some super person. <laughs> I'm a regular person. I'm a lame person that is having to get it right on a day to day basis. But I will share this. When I cut my hair, it was like it was that weight lifted off of me, a bondage. And it was, it's just crazy how the Lord works. I said, OK, I, I repent. I don't mean crazy. It's amazing how God works. Because he did something that I couldn't do for myself. I was in bondage to this thing. It might sound silly and dumb to you, but that's what I was struggling with. And I couldn't stop. I've been clean and sober from all kinds of stuff for 14 years. I don't drink. I don't smoke. I don't watch certain stuff. You know, ask anybody that knows me. I, my, my life is clean now. But, but little things can creep in. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. And, and I could not break free from this thing. And it was like, I, and my wife, my wife knows, she said, you know, I have a very compulsive personality. Very compulsive. When I get involved in something, maybe that's why I am I, the way I am with the Lord. Because when I go in for something, I go all in. And I go all out. I don't, I don't half butt it. This is like, if I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it. But that's with everything. And then that's not necessarily a healthy thing. So all that to be said is the Lord broke this off of me. I couldn't even stop and he broke it off of me. And and it may sound silly, but when I cut my hair, I was liberated. I was freed. There was no more of this this obsession to, to do this thing for what? For vanity. This is what the scripture is talking about. All is vanity unless we're placing our whole heart in Christ and recognizing that he is our all. You see, you may not, getting ways may not be the thing for you. But what, what is that thing that you're struggling with right now? Because I know I'm not the only one in this room that's struggling. Because if I am, then y'all are liars. <laughs> <laughs> but what is that thing that you can pinpoint where, where, where you can feel the Holy Spirit tugging on your heart saying, Give it up. Give it up. In order to grow, we have to allow the Holy Spirit to show us what's really going on within our innermost being. You see, because I could fake it with you. If I didn't say nothing right now, y'all would be like, oh, it's all good. Because you got nothing else to go off but what I say. Right. We're only accountable for what we're willing to be accountable for. We can fool each other, but you and I can't fool God. He knows. And when you're honest and when you're real with him. He'll vindicate you, he'll liberate you, he'll clean, clean you up, he'll forgive you, and he'll send, you'll, he'll send you on your way, and you'll be good. Last week, we, we learned that, that some in authority tend to abuse their power and deceive others, portraying themselves to be righteous. That's kind of what we looked at last week. Um, they were false in their righteousness. They were falsely righteous. They would go in and out of the holy place in the temple uh, and they would they were be esteemed by many people. So again, they had everybody fooled. But the truth was they were living a lie. How they made themselves out to be was not actually who they really were. They were hypocrites. They were wearing a mask. They were portraying themselves in one fashion. But in fact, they were actually a totally different person behind closed doors. Like I had just stated, no matter how hard any person tries, we may cover it up like makeup, cover ourselves up. But eventually the truth will come to light. You know, the, the best way to deal with something like that is be the one to admit where you're wrong. Don't hide it, hide it, hide it until unbeknownst to you, the truth comes out and then you're exposed because it's a million times worse that way. It's better to humble yourself and say, hey, man, I, I wasn't right. This is what was going on. And I'm, and I'm right. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to admit this. You admit it to the Lord and you talk to whoever you need to talk to and get right with them. And then you're clear. You're clean. There's no more guilt. There's no more shame. And then you're right back on the, in, on the, in the saddle and you keep going. That's the best way to take care of that. Last week, we also looked at the importance of, of having a genuine fear of God. What does that look like in our lives? But to have a genuine fear of God in my heart and how I live. 
before Him. That if we consider Yahweh in all that we do and make Him first priority in our lives, that it will be well with us no matter what we must endure. That's what we learned last week. This is a theme that, that you can take with you for the rest of your life. Put Him first. Number one priority in your life. And no matter what you go through, you're going to be well. It's going to be well with your soul. That's why they, we sing that song. It is well. <laughs> why is it well? Because I, I'm, 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 I'm clinging to God. I'm clinging to Christ. So it's well. Even though, man, I over here, you know what I mean? Whatever. My, you know, might be your wife got stage four cancer. Obviously, yeah, you don't want that to happen. But it is well. Why is it well? It's well with your soul because you're clinging to him. He's the one that's sustaining you. But if you don't, if you're not sustained by God, I don't know what you're doing. When the when the when the storms of life hit, you you guys drove in that in that wind today, it ain't no joke. Spiritually speaking, that's what happens. You're either in a storm, you're getting out of a storm, or you're going right back into a storm. That's the Christian life. That's why I say it's the hardest life to live because it ain't no joke and it ain't all pretty. I don't know why people try to, yes, we're saved, and yes, Christ, and all that good stuff, and I'm not, I'm not denouncing none of that. But the other side of it is, the Christian life is a grimy life, because it's, it's, it's filled with, 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 with landmines and potholes and, and all this stuff that you have to maneuver in and out of. But if you cling to Christ, you're going to find a way to navigate your way through life and still be good. But again, it takes intentionality. You and I have to forge it in our mind and in our hearts that this is what I'm going to go after and it doesn't matter. I'm not going to be deterred, right? You, you cannot let yourself be deterred. And what Satan will do and what your flesh will do and what circumstances will do will try to cave you in to where you buckle. Don't buckle under the pressure of life. Don't, don't buckle under the temptation of your flesh. But again, clinging to Christ, knowing who God is, that will help you in your days and your moments of distress. Amen. We also looked at, but for those who refuse, those who are bent on not humbling themselves before the hand of God, they will suffer the consequences of their actions and live void of genuine peace and joy. No matter what their outward circumstances look like. If we don't humble ourselves, I don't care how much money, I don't care what you look like, I don't care what toys you have, you're not going to have genuine peace and joy. That is only manufactured by the Holy Spirit and submission to him for you and I to receive that. This leads us to our portion of scripture this morning. We have several main points and the first one is this. Some who are righteous experience much suffering that ain't fair <laughs> i didn't say it's fair but this is what the bible says some who are righteous experience much suffering while some wicked people experience outward blessings that's crazy what i'm trying to live for you but i'm over here suffering and this dude over here don't care a rip about who you are but yet he's blessed with all this stuff or all these outward signs of blessing, privilege, and comfort. That's crazy. The fact that this is actually a reality in the world we live in, again, speaks to the fact of the vanity and uncertainty of all worldly things. And that ultimately... There is no eternal happiness in them. The fact that righteous people suffer and wicked people get over. If that's not vanity, I don't know what is because that, that ain't right. <laughs> it doesn't make sense to my, my human understanding. It is a wild thing to think of a righteous person that they will suffer in this life while a wicked person will experience many outward blessings and long life. But saints, we must remember God's ways are not our ways. And he doesn't think the way you and I think. While it may seem that the righteous only suffer and are not blessed while the wicked continuously prosper without being held accountable, it is not necessarily true. 
Romans chapter 3 verses 10 and 11 tells us, As it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands and no one seeks for God. And we know that the scripture tells us in Isaiah chapter 53 verse 6, All we like sheep have gone astray. We've all turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. So how are some righteous and some wicked? This is very important to understand, because if we don't get this right, then we're going to struggle with this whole premise of righteous people suffering and wicked people being blessed. But how are some righteous and are some wicked? Really, it all boils down to the mercy and the grace of God. God is so merciful. And he's so gracious that he will deem some people to receive imputed righteousness while some wicked people will prosper. You see, those who respond to the conviction of God with the measure of faith that he gives, those receive Jesus Christ. Jesus, the Messiah, Yeshua HaMashiach, however you want to say his name. They receive the Son of God who is righteousness. He is righteousness. It's not that he has righteousness. He is it. He, in fact, is the righteousness that everyone has. Who has it? Therefore, since those individuals have received Christ, they receive his righteousness. If you're a child of God this morning, I don't care where you're at in your maturity level. If you have said, Jesus Christ, I cannot save myself. I need you to be my savior and my Lord. If you've said that from your heart of hearts and allowed him to come into your heart, you are righteous because you have the imputed righteousness of Christ upon your life. For that, you should praise and you should be shouting hallelujah, praise you, Lord. Thank you so much because you've given me so much and I don't deserve anything. If that doesn't get you up in the morning, I don't know what will. Because first take ain't cutting it for me. Stephen A. Smith ain't cutting it for me. The Warriors ain't cutting it for me. I don't care. The Niners ain't cutting it for me. Yeah, they're going to the Super Bowl. Yeah, I'm going to watch it. They ain't cutting it for me, though. That's not getting me up in the morning. That doesn't give me goosebumps and gets me juice for the day. I need this supernatural imputed righteousness of Christ to give me what I need on a moment-to-moment basis. You see, the wicked are those who refuse to repent and are bent on living a life apart from the Lord. So, None are really righteous on their own. All are wicked because of the mercy and the grace of God. Some will be imputed with the righteousness of Christ and some will choose to not receive it. When you think of those who are righteous who suffer, Jesus Christ himself, that's our main, that's the main one we look at. I mean, he had no sin in him, yet he suffered. He suffered to the point where, you know, A prophet's not received well in his hometown. His own family members rejected him. He did so much good. He went around healing people, the lame, the sick, the lepers. He was casting demons out of people that were being oppressed and possessed by demons. I mean, he did so much good. He gave his life and and, and we treated him poorly. Humanity treated him poorly. So he's the chief one that we look at as someone who's righteous, who suffers. You also look at Job, Asaph, and Lazarus, just to name a few people who in the eyes of the Father are righteous and yes, they, yet they suffered unfairly. But you see, in God's sovereign wisdom, he knows why he allows righteous people to sometimes suffer while he allows wicked people to sometimes prosper outwardly. Notice I say prosper outwardly. Because there's really no inward blessing for those who are wicked. It's a deception. It's an illusion. It's thinking if I have more or if I have what my flesh wants and I'm able to gratify gratify my flesh at a moment's notice that I'm truly blessed. That's not necessarily blessing. That can become a curse. It's like King Midas. You know, fairy tale King Midas. Everything I touch turned to gold. But then... He's trying to touch his food. He can't eat his food. (laughs) Everything's gold. And what does he do? Then he's like, take it from me. I don't want any of this. And he's left with absolutely nothing. Well, if you watch the Disney version, he's left with a hamburger. 
<laughs> took everything. Took his scepter, took his crown. He had a gold tooth, took his gold tooth. Oh boy, he had nothing left. But, but that's how it is sometimes with, with, with those who choose not to live for Christ, but prosper outwardly. They're like, oh man, and there's nothing wrong with a Tesla, whatever. Maybe I should use a different example. Uh, a Maserati. You got a Maserati. I got the house on the hill. I got the, you know what I mean? I got the money in the bank. I got this. I got that. Nothing wrong with all those things. But when we look to those things to fulfill us, man, it becomes a curse because we're like, I need more. I need more. I'm not satisfied. It's like when you get high and the high wears off, what do you got to do? You got to get high again. You need more. You need something stronger because it don't work. You could be sober as a whistle. But what I'm saying is when it comes to anything worldly that we try to fill ourselves with, to fill up on, to gratify ourselves, to make us ourselves feel whole and happy and peaceful, it don't work. It don't work. It's like those donuts in the foyer. Y'all eat the donuts. I eat the donut. And then by, you know, what I mean, not even not even 12 o'clock, 1130. You're like, dude. I need something else, man. That's not going to sustain me. A little cup of coffee and a donut, man, that, that's, that's like a sweet treat. But you need real solid, good substance to fill you, to make you whole physically and spiritually. It's the same way. But the fact that God allows some righteous people who've been imputed with the righteousness of his son Christ to suffer and some wicked people to prosper outwardly. This is one of the mysteries and the miseries of life. It ultimately speaks to the emptiness of all things here on earth apart from God. I hope you're understanding that by now. If you hadn't known that before, from before when we started this book, that you can enjoy the things. I'm not saying, I'm not being legalistic and say, don't enjoy a barbecue. Don't enjoy, you know, whatever, you know, go to the beach with the dog, whatever it is you're into. Enjoy those things. Just don't look for those things to fulfill you in a spiritual way, ultimately, because it's not going to. Only Christ can. Only Christ can satisfy the longings of your soul. Amen? Think about this. Again, I said it a minute ago, but how can a a wicked person truly be blessed eternally or internally when they lack the foundation of peace found in God alone? They can't. They cannot be blessed. They can't be blessed in that sense that they have, you know, They sleep soundly at night. They have no worries. Why does the person who's going through, I'll say it again, some kind of sickness, some kind of mounting, you know, uh, just wrong done to them where it's like all the all the 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 cards are stacked against them. And yet they, they have a joy about them and they have a peace that's supernatural, even though their outward circumstances by any account, you would say, man, I feel so bad for them. Their life just looks horrible. How do they function? They function because it's a supernatural power that's in in, in giving them the ability to rise above their circumstances and not be bogged down by what you see. The Bible clearly says, walk by faith, not by sight. And many times we get it wrong. We walk by sight and not by faith. I just I'm not going to say it again, but I just showed you my own little spew of myself walking by sight. (laughs) It's like, what in the world do you freaking think anybody else cares about that? No, the Lord's like, dude, stop. Walk by faith, not by sight. You see, the reality is the chief good and supreme happiness of a person is not to be had here on earth. It's not. The chief end of man is to glorify God, not glorify his stomach, not glorify his appetite. Not glorify his his eyes, but to glorify God. That's the chief end of man. That's why we were created. Because in glorifying God, we get everything we actually need. Because we have real, true communion and fellowship with him. And that communion and fellowship is enough. It should be enough. Think about all the things that are vying for your attention right now. In your life. Maybe even right now in your mind. You're like, you can't even hear me clearly. It's like the peanut teacher, blah, 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 blah. Because you got all this other stuff vying for your attention. You can't focus. You don't need no riddling, man. You need to call upon the Holy Spirit to quicken your spirit and, and cause you to be still before God. And hear what, what, what the servant of the Lord has to say to you with the power of the Holy Spirit. But think of all the things that are trying to distract us every day, all day. You see, there is a future state when all things will be set right and everyone will have their portion, their proper portion, whether good or bad. 
it will come to pass. It's just not here on this planet. That's why you see some who are living a righteous life suffer so much. And wicked people who could care less about the true and living God seem to prosper outwardly. But all the rights will be, uh, all the wrongs will be righted one day. And we'll all have to give an account. The second main point is this. Because of ungodliness in the world, it is best to make the most of your life to eat, to drink, and be merry, to be cheerful, to be full of joy, not to be an Eeyore, oh, because it could have been, oh, oh, it's raining, oh, it's windy, oh, I don't want to go, oh, it's, you know, it's like, dude, Debbie Downer, man, why is it all negative? I'll be real with you, I got to fight against that every day. That's kind of my disposition in life, where I'm constantly like, I can just easily choose to complain, gripe, and be bitter about stuff. Or I could go the uphill way and say, you know what, praise you, Lord, thank you. Thank you that you woke me up. Thank you for the, you know, we were in the car leaving, and, and it was funny. It was like, the wind blowing all crazy. I had to pull up the car to the back of the patio because it's like just too much going on. Stinking wooden wooden door to the fence is swaying back and forth. I'm like, kill us. Don't get knocked out, man. Watch what you're doing. My daughter's tripping out. You know what I mean? Everybody gets in the car. Then I, because uh, Keith and Cindy are at the beach. So, you know what I mean? We had to bring the communion tray. We had everything. We're ready to go. And Veronica's like, you got to get communion tray? I said, no. I said, hold on. <laughs> got to get up. Go take my shoes off. Run upstairs. Go underneath the bed. Get the communion tray. Come back down. And then, uh, you know, usually I pray in the morning, you know, we're in the car, you know, everybody together, whatever. And then Veronica's like, who wants to pray today? And uh, Tears just said, I'll pray. And she's all, thank you, Lord, for the rain. Thank you, Lord, for the wind. It's so beautiful. And, 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 and that was her prayer. She was thanking the Lord for the wind and the rain. A little child, honest child, just truthful about what it is. While in my heart, I'm going like, Fighting against that, that grumbling and complaining. It reminds me of the children of Israel. It's like, dude, you got your manna every day. You're still grumbling and complaining. Be grateful that you got food to put in your belly every day. Not saying, I don't like how it tastes. I'm tired of this. I wish I could go back to Egypt because they fed us better. You were slaves in Egypt. They didn't feed you better. But ain't that how we are as people? It's so easy to go that way. That, once again, that's why you and I have to be intentional. We have to purpose, and we purpose. This is why it's so important to be in the Word daily. Because daily, if you purpose to get in the Word, daily you will gain momentum. And daily, if you gain momentum, you will break through. I think most of us, we know how to gain momentum in negative ways because we've all come from that lifestyle of we had momentum from living a lifestyle so wrong that we just broke through the wrong way (laughs) into negative stuff. So now it's just a matter of shifting your paradigm, shifting your perspective, And all the attention that you would spend on doing things that were worthless and negative shifted into the word of God and Christ Jesus. It's really that simple. Obviously, we need the Holy Spirit to help us do that. But but in in the sense of choosing, it is simple. We just have to choose differently. And, And over time, you will see momentum build in your life and then a hunger and a desire for Christ more and more and it'll go from maybe you read the word not at all to maybe now you read the word five minutes a day to where now you've gotten to a point where it's like you you know you can't go a day without the word because you just ain't right because he's so much a part of your life he's so consumed you the bible says be not drunk with wine but be intoxicated with who the holy spirit how do we do that by inviting him into our lives, by getting in the word, by keeping him, keeping our perspective based on, Lord, I need you. Like Moses, if you don't go before me, I'm not going. Simple as that. I mean, if, if you live like that, you have the recipe for success always, every day, all day, no matter what anybody says or does to you. But do you believe that? Do you believe that in the core of your being, that that's how it is? And if I live like that, I will be blessed. See, if you're praying, but you don't expect, then you're wasting your time. You need to pray with an expectancy. Lord, hear me. I know that you hear me. I know you're going to bless me. I know you're going to give me what I need. Do you pray like that? Do you cry out to God like that, expecting him to answer? I know that's from the Holy Spirit because that ain't even in my notes, man. 
But this is something that we need. I need it. I need to think this way. And that's why I say it becomes something that you have to actively work at. Like, like, like somebody who's getting ready for the Olympics in Paris this year. They're busting their butts working hard to make sure that they're in the leanest shape possible, that they don't have no body fat, that they're not eating no garbage, that they're just so locked in so they can win the prize of that gold medal. That's how you have to be about your Christian life. That's why the Bible says many are called, but few are chosen. Are you one of the few today? Ask yourself that. Are you in a position, are you putting yourself in a position to go and run hard after Christ? If the answer is yes, praise God. If the answer is no, praise God. Because that can change in a heartbeat, in a nanosecond. That's why I love the idea of, 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 of tithing and the Sabbath. The Lord can do more with one day than with 364 days of you working. <laughs> the Lord can do more with one dollar than $100,000 of your own. Do you believe that? The mountains will move. <laughs> I mean, he created this whole thing. He's waiting for us to activate our faith and move on faith. Learn from Thomas. Don't, don't have to say, I need to see you before I move. He said, blessed are those that, that believe in me and haven't seen Thomas. Not that he was knocking Thomas, but that's a lesson for us. That's an encouragement for us. None of us have seen, but yet we believe. How much blessed are we? How much more blessed are we? Oh, all right, I'm getting worked up over here. Let me get focus. <laughs> we need to reference back a few verses to understand what Solomon meant when he said that, um, you know, this whole thing about, you know, just eat, drink and be merry. He's not promoting a gluttonous lifestyle with no regard to restraint. He's not saying that at all. OK, what he's saying is because wicked men are honored as righteous and those who are truly righteous are treated harshly. Your best bet in this fallen world is to enjoy your lot in life. Eat, drink and be merry. <laughs> While it is unbiblical to live only for pleasure, living a life of joy for the Lord is certainly biblical. John chapter 15, verse 9 through 11 tells us, As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. So, I mean, it just, he tells us clearly right here. Man, we just, we, we, need, we need to abide. We need to abide. What are you abiding in today? Again, please, if you're a Niner fan, please don't tell me you're abiding in the Niners. Whether they win or lose, I mean, I'm going to watch the game and I'm probably going to yell at the TV and, you know, do all that. <laughs> but, but, I mean, I, my stake ain't that deep. It don't move me one way or another if they win or lose. But I know some people, it's like, man, the Warriors lose or the Sharks lose. And it's like, man, your whole day's missing. What? How are you that moved by some sports team? Be moved by the right things. That's all I'm trying to say. You see, when, when, we, when we live like this, uh, abiding in Christ, right? Abiding in him and, and having our joy full, we will enjoy our lot in life. When you abide in Christ, you will enjoy your lot in life. You will eat. You will drink. You will be merry. No matter if you got crumbs or you got shrimp and, and, and lobster, you got top ramen. You're going to be like, man, Lord, praise you for this top ramen. I'm going to be like, I'm in prison, man. I'm about to make me some spread. <laughs> and I'm about to make this the best top ramen I've ever had. Because your perspective is right. Because you're being filled with his joy. Despite the unjust treatment that you may receive from others, you're not going to bicker and quarrel about that kind of stuff. And if you got the lobster and steak, you're going to praise God and thank God for the lobster and steak. You know, whether you have lot or have little, you're content in Christ. Amen. The third main point is this. We must learn to be in, we, we must learn to be content, excuse me, not knowing everything. The reality in this life in regards to why certain things happen is simply we will never be able to find out why things happen here on earth. We just won't. We won't. 
humanity may find out that a thing has been done, but not the reason why it's been done. Um, Again, an example, I I had a great CPR training yesterday. And again, (laughs) earlier in the week, grumbling. I'm like, I don't want to go to work on Saturday, man. It's my one day to sleep in. They got me over here. I got to go CPR. It's like, dude, put on your big boy pants. If you don't do CPR, you don't work. So it's like, okay, the Lord slapped me real quick on that one. But anyways, so I went to this CPR training and it was great. Um, The instructor was great. He used no visuals. He talked, and for someone to be able to talk and keep a group engaged, you know that's a good speaker. But he basically was a a, a medic in in Iraq for 10 years. So he had a lot of experience working with soldiers and seeing all the ins and outs from a medic's point of view of how things work. And and it was great. You know, it was great. Um, he, 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 He talked a lot about the functions of the heart, and I learned a lot. You know, about what he said, you know, I guess, you know, my wife knows all this because she worked in the medical field for so many years. But, you know, you got the upper part of the heart and the bottom part of the heart and the upper part of the heart pumps blood to the bottom and the bottom part is supposed to disperse the blood to the rest of the body. That's how it works. Right. But when when one or the other, you know, off, you know, off shooting, not correctly, then you got problems. And as eloquently and, and, and as clearly as he was able to 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 describe that and explain that. As, as, as smart as this man was, and I'm taking no credit away from him at all, he couldn't explain why God chose to make the heart the way the heart was and why the God chose to make the heart pump the way the heart pumped. He could explain how it functioned, but he had no idea. Neither does the best doctor from Harvard or Stanford. They don't know why God made the heart the way he made the heart. He, they don't know why he made the fingers the way the fingers are. Why are our fingers not out the side of our temple? Walk around like this. <laughs> but I'm saying, right, is super silly, but nobody knows. <laughs> nobody knows. <laughs> you see, the ways of God are in the deep and not to be traced. They are unsearchable and past finding out. There is a depth of wisdom and knowledge in them, unsearchable by the wisest of men. Romans chapter 11, verse 33 tells us, Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. It is best for people not to trouble themselves with endless and fruitless inquiries about these things, but quietly submit to God's will and providence and to live in the fear of God and the comfortability of enjoyment of his blessings. This is why we are told in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6, but godliness with contentment is great gain. You can't even grasp how much goodness is in the gain of being content. Your whole life is going to be blessed and and smothered in the blessings of godliness with contentment. It's a great gain for you. Christ followers should focus their effort on pursuing holiness in their conduct, their attitude, and their thought life. We will not remain godly for long if we are not content with what God has given us. Searching. I'm not content. I need more. I need this. This covers material blessings as well as our desire to know the answers to things. This is what got Eve in trouble in the Garden of Eden. She was tempted by the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the boastful pride of life. She thought if she could know all things like God, that she would be happy. But she was better off just being content. All right, let's go ahead and look at these verses and break them down a little bit closer now. We'll look at verse 14. Oh, man. All right. Lord, help me out. It says, there is a vanity that takes place on earth, and there are righteous people to whom it happens according to the deeds of the wicked. 
And there are wicked people to whom it happens according to the deeds of the righteous. I said that this also is vanity. Again, why do bad, why do the bad sometimes have it good and the good have it bad? This question boggles the mind of so many people in the world. Solomon is speaking here from a viewpoint that excludes eternity. It's looking at it from a worldly perspective. Why, why do the righteous suffer while wicked people prosper? And obviously this is a genuine concern that, 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 that he felt and it made life meaningless for him. Remember, he had everything. He had an over and abundance of everything he could ever have. I don't even want to get into the whole thing about wives and concubines, but he had way too much doing way too much and nothing satisfied him. And he was, I could only imagine the pit of despair that that man must have felt in his heart of hearts, knowing that he, he, he built vineyards and this and that, and, and, you know, it was used to build the temple and all these different things. But yet he, he was not satisfied. He's like, I'm empty. He was like Bill Gates and Trump and all these people way before they ever were, you know, why is this man? So much wealth, but yet he, he was empty inside. And he asked this question, why do good men and women suffer? And why do bad men and women seem to get away with everything, able to live reckless lives without having to suffer the consequences? Well, not much has changed down through the centuries. The Bible is clear. Nothing's new under the sun. You see, we may just be younger and haven't experienced it or don't look back at history to know that this all stuff has already happened before. But all that we're seeing, it's already gone down. This ain't the first generation where a bunch of rip offs are getting over and people that are trying to live right are getting snuffed. This has been going on for 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 centuries. The prophet Isaiah also saw his fair share of this in his own time. Isaiah chapter five, verse 20 says, woe to those who call evil good and good evil. Who put darkness for light and light for darkness? Who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter? It must have have grieved Isaiah's heart to to, to see the wickedness going on within the people of Israel. Not not to mention all of the, the, the surrounding nations who were treating them harshly. This same question still to this day is a major hindrance stopping many people from coming to Jesus Christ. You want to know why? Because people will say the same old question. If God is so good, then why does he allow innocent people to suffer? They all say that. Why does he allow that little baby to get all this and that happen? And to be quite honest with you, as your pastor, I have an answer, but I don't have the answer that many people would welcome. The, really, the reality is there are many things that are simply a mystery to us that God has chosen not to reveal to us at this present time. But the word of God is our authority, and so we search the scriptures for answers. The Bible tells us that everything was perfect until sin entered this world. When sin entered it in, entered into the world, excuse me, it brought with itself suffering and death, both physical and spiritual. Romans chapter 5 verse 12 tells us, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. That statement in a nutshell is the reason why some righteous suffer while some wicked prosper from an earthly perspective. A biblical worldview says all humanity comes from the line of Adam. So we all inherit his sinful nature. Can we all agree on that? Okay. For those who ask the question, If God is so good, then why does he allow the innocent to suffer unless the Lord gives them revelation to trust him, to take him at his word and to respond to the measure of faith given to them? They will simply balk at the idea of us inheriting Adam's sinful nature. Okay. if we choose to deny the fact that we have a creator who is the God of Israel, 
the God of the Torah, the God of the Holy Bible, we will stumble over the fact that sometimes righteous people suffer while the wicked prosper. Are we trekking along with what's going on here? I'm, I'm trying to be sensitive about this because I know it's real. You see, when young children get abused and are hurt at a young age, for all those who work extremely hard and don't seem to ever catch a break, while those who cheat, lie, rob, murder, and defy God at the moment go unpunished, it's easy to lose hope. In our human understanding, it's, not just, it's just not fair and we don't understand. We can easily grow a hard heart and dismiss the claims of the word of God. But ask yourself this question first before you do. What's a better answer? That we all just evolved and we're living here by chance? That you spawned from a bunch of molecules somewhere off in space and, and, and you came from a monkey? That, that, that you're a descendant of, of apes? Is that a better, is that a better answer? Is, is this a better answer that every event's random? So you have no purpose? You're, you're, just, you're just a cadaver out here living? That you're soulless and just gratify your flesh because you might as well, we don't, you're going to go into oblivion when you, when, you, when you breathe your last? Is that a better answer? Or does the Bible clearly tell you why you were created and what you were created for? And that human suffering is simply just being at the wrong place at the wrong time. I, 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 can't, I can't stomach that. I, I can't just live with that. There's something more. But we also need to take into account, again, that no one is righteous in and of themselves. Again, we are only deemed righteous by the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. Apart from him, all of us are wayward and wicked people. This is another truth that the unbeliever left to him or herself simply can't come to terms with. This was a great question about the book of Job. It was almost unanswerable apart from a life that desires eternity and our accountability in, in the life to come. We see this statement again. There are wicked men to whom it happens according to the work of righteousness. Probably even more of a problem, Solomon had to ask the question, well, again, why do wicked men seem to be blessed? The strength of this question also made life seem meaningless to him. One might say that this question is even more troublesome because in a very real sense, there are no just men, as I just stated, and all can be seen as wicked in some kind of way. The application is this. The reason why goodness is shown to the undeserving is the remarkable mercy of God. You see, both the servant of God and the sinner who refuses God wake up to the sunshine, or in our instance this morning, wake up to the wind and the rain. Wicked and righteous people both woke up this morning. Just because you're righteous, you know, don't mean nothing. And just because you're wicked didn't mean, oh, what, because you're wicked, you're not going to wake up. You woke up. You had life. Both are given breath and bodies to walk in. We're, we're walking, we're functioning, whether you're a righteous person or a wicked person, you know, your health is good and you have uh, an allotted uh, time of days. But ultimately, we, we must remember Matthew chapter 5 verse 45 tells us, so that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven, for he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain to the just and the unjust. And if it was in Jesus' day, he would probably break it down and talk about the farmers. You got one farmer who's wicked. You got one farmer that's righteous. Lord, The Lord allowed the rain to fall on both crops. For whatever reason, the Lord may allow the wicked person's crops to go higher than the righteous person. I don't know why, but, you know, he has a reason for it all. But he allows the rain and the sun to fall on the just and the unjust. One day, though, one day we will all stand before God and have to give an account of all we have done. Every little jot and tittle. It's crazy. Every word that, we're, that we said, every word spoken is going to be brought against us. Unless we're vindicated by Christ. If we're vindicated by Christ, then we're justified. But for the sinner who does not repent, every little thing they said is going to be said. It's going to be brought against them. And you're not going to be able to say, I didn't say it. You got to fess up. You see, for us, 
as believers of Christ, we will all go before the Bema seat where he's going to say, okay, what did you do with my son? And I'm going to give you a, I'm going to give you rewards blessed on what you did. Kind of like the talents. So you don't want to be that dude who had the one talent and buried it. He had a wrong perspective of the master. The other two understood that he was good and he was just. The one with the one, he, he, he thought, he said, you're, you're a crude, harsh man. And I knew that, 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 that you wanted to return, but I, I just didn't want to disappoint you, so I buried it. He's a good God, man. Get out there and use your one talent and do something. So for us, we're going to go before the Bema Seat. You ain't going to lose your salvation, but you may not have a lot of blessing because if you didn't do nothing, it ain't just about sitting in this seat, man. I like what, 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 what I heard a long time ago. This is the huddle. I'm a sports guy. It's the huddle. You know, what, what does the huddle do? God is the owner, coach, whatever. He gives the play to the quarterback who's the pastor. The pastor relays, relays the play to, the, to the, the players, the church, the rest of the body. And it's what we do when we get out of this building that's going to the line of scrimmage and executing the game plan. You can't just come here and do nothing. You got to come here and execute and apply everything that you hear here out into your life out there. That's how you're going to get all the rewards later when you go before the Bema seat. If you just come here and sit and don't do nothing for the other six days and wait to get fed again or go back to the manna. I'm not God. I can't feed you. This is one day. This is one day for an hour, you know, hour, maybe 10, 20 minutes. This is not going to sustain you for the rest of the week. You better get up tomorrow and get your manna yourself. You have to. That's getting in the word, man. Bread of life. Living water. I mean, it's real talk. If you ain't doing that, I mean, you're going to be shriveled up, malnourished like a crackhead when it comes to spiritual matter. I'm just keeping it real, right? They're not healthy. They're not healthy. So I'm saying you don't want to be a crackhead when it comes to spiritual things. So you better feed yourself and feast and gorge yourself on the word daily. That way you could be swole, strong like Superman up in here and ain't nothing going to stop you when it comes to trying to deter you from the walk that you have with the Lord. But it goes back to intention, church. What are we being intentional about? I can't harp more enough about that. We got to be intentional because you'll see the fruit and the benefit of your life when you hone in and start going after the things of God. Going back to what I was talking about. So for us, we just got the beam of seat. Okay. Well, the unbeliever must stand before the great white throne judgment. And I I don't take no pleasure in sharing this because this is horrible. You don't you do not want to be at the great white throne judgment. That means you did not make it, man. That means he's going to say, depart from me. I never knew you. You worker of iniquity. I don't care if you said you fed the sick in the land and you cast out demons. Depart from me. I didn't know you. Daniel chapter seven, verse nine and ten tells us. As I looked, thrones were placed, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. Speaking of God, his clothing was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames. Its wheels were burning fire, and a stream of fire issued and came out from before him. And thousand thousand served him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court sat in judgment, and the books were opened. It's going to be a gang of people in in those lines. That's not the line you want to be in. If you don't get nothing else out of this message today, do business with God today. Today is the day of salvation. I don't know who up in here is saved and who's not. That's not my judgment to make. Make sure before you leave this building, you do business with God. Because he will forgive if you reach out. Amen? All right, 15 through 17, and we're done. Actually doing pretty good on time. Crazy, because I talk a lot. I know Lou's like, dude, this dude talk. I do, I do talk. I'm not putting him on blast. He, he keeps me, you know, he, he just, he tries to, you know, keep me, keep me on track. But I'm actually doing pretty good for today. All right, well, let's go. We're not done yet, so maybe I just, I don't believe in jinxing. But anyway, let's just go. 15 through 17, and I commend, uh, and I commend joy. For man has nothing better under the sun but to eat, drink, and be joyful. For this will go well with him in his toil through the days of his life that God has given him under the sun. When I applied my heart to know wisdom and to see the business that is done on earth, how neither day 
nor night do one's eyes see sleep. That's so sad. Then I have saw all the work of God that man cannot find out the work that is done under the sun. However, much man may toil in his seeking, he will not find it out. Even though a wise man claims to know, he cannot find it out. Man, that's crazy. I don't know if it's that translation or what, but I'm telling you, if I don't have the Holy Spirit, I don't understand that. <laughs> There's just a whole lot going on, man. You go to King James, you're going to have the do's and nows in there. Woo. You better get the Holy Spirit because there's just no way. All right, so I commended enjoyment. With the meaninglessness of life, it was so plain to Solomon. All he could counsel was to make the best of a bad situation and enjoy life the best way possible. Have you had to do that? Have you had to do that? Have you just made, had to make the best of a, of a bad situation? <laughs> right? Sometimes that's how life is, man. But for the Christian, we, we, should, we should be okay with that. We should be like, you know what, Lord, praise, praise you that, you know, things ain't worse, you know. I don't know. You broke something. Praise God you didn't break something else. I don't, I don't know. You know what I'm saying? I'm just saying. You know what I mean? That's kind of how we got to have the outlook. Because if not, man, it's, it's just so easy to just get into a funk of like, man, resentment and bitterness and backbiting. And why me? And I don't get it. And what the, why is this happening? Right? We've all been there. But that's just, that's not healthy. That's not, that's not life. That's death. Remember, he already explored pleasure in chapter 2 and found it to be unsatisfactory. But here he uses the word commend uh, in, in Hebrew, uh, uh, shabach, S-H-A-B-A-C-H. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correct, which, which has the root meaning of addressing in a loud tone. It can also mean pacify. The translation of pleasure in Ecclesiastes chapter 2 verse 1 suggests an enjoyable feeling or experience that cat could either have good or evil uh, evil source. With our entire earthly experience, when it's taken into account, there's nothing better for men and women than to enjoy food, drink, and be merry, to rejoice. Solomon had set out to discover if pleasure would provide meaning to life, but he found it could not. And the application is simply this. The truth is that pleasure is an insufficient foundation of life. If, if it had it not been, then yeah, you could live your best life now and it wouldn't matter. But in and of itself, pleasure is insufficient for you having a foundation to build your life on. But that doesn't mean that it isn't good. Solomon commended pleasure stating that there's nothing better to do. Since life is vanity, we should embrace pleasure. To eat and drink and be merry is the best way that we're going to live in this life. But we can only, this is the caveat, this is the truth here. We can only truly enjoy these pleasures through the lens of fearing God and trusting Him by faith. Because you cannot eat, drink, and be merry Truly, unless you fear God and have the perspective of he is the one who's blessed you with all the things you're able to have, whether little or much. You see, if you truly fear God, pleasure will be with you in all your hard work. Pleasure will be a reward for all your hard work. Doesn't it feel good to work an honest day's job and be able to go home and eat your meal of choice and sit where you want to sit and just relax? Like, like, don't take that for granted because some people, they work super hard and they go home and there's no peace. They can't enjoy a meal. They can't enjoy quietness in their own home. Right. And sometimes those are righteous people. Sometimes those are people that fear God and they don't have that. So don't take anything the Lord has given you or me for granted. This is similar to Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 9, where Solomon asks, What profit is there to the worker from that which he toils? And then he answers in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 12. I perceive that there is nothing better for them than to be joyful and to do good as long as they live. That's what we should be doing, church. To enjoy your lot in life and to do good as long as you live. He's given you breath in your lungs today. You can live good today. Don't beat yourself up about yesterday. It's done. 
Don't beat yourself because that's what Satan loved to do. What did you do two weeks ago? Bruh, I'm not going to be tripping off what I did two weeks ago. His mercies are new today. Don't put that on me. I already got right with it. Now, if you haven't got right, get right. And then, you know, your yesterday can start now and then keep moving. You know what I'm saying? But either way, do not let Satan put you in some kind of trap where you're just caught up in all these things you didn't do and how you did wrong. Because then that's just not healthy, man. That's not healthy. Know the Lord loves you. Know the Lord cares about you. Know the Lord has the best plan for you that you, could, you couldn't even come up with a good plan. And he got the best plan for you. Just surrender yourself to him and watch it all unfold. Amen. Amen. Solomon also tells us here that pleasure is an aid to help. To provide comfort in a confusing and troublesome world. I'll go back to the fact of family. If you have a family that it loves you, embraces you, cares for you, um, you know, has a word of, of cheer and, 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 and admonition for you, man, you better cherish that because there are so many people that just don't have that. There's turmoil, there's anger, there's bitterness, there's resentment, there's backbiting, there's pain, there's gossip. And this is what they go home to every day. So for those of you that are in that position, you better cling tight to Christ and cling tight to your church family. Because that's why we're here, man. You know, I, if I could, I, I, I want to hang out with everybody outside of this building. You know, I'm trying to link up with men and this and that. You know what I mean? I'm only one person. But I mean, the thing is, we, we need to band together because iron sharpens iron. You feel what I'm saying? But we got to come together because I get it. People are hurting. People are suffering. That's, this is a spiritual hospital, man. This is why we're here. This is why the Lord established the church to obviously edify us and bring honor and glory to him. But we need to utilize one another. We're the body. When one person does well, we should all rejoice. When one person's suffering and hurting, man, we all suffer and hurt. This ain't no game. So take advantage of the resources and the people around you because we're here to be a blessing. Amen. Amen. Paul said something similar to this in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17. He said, as for the rich of this present age, charge them not to be haughty nor, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. Um, this is similar, to, again, to Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 12. The application is this. The reality is if we don't set our hope on God, money will end up owning us instead of us owning it. But Paul also encouraged us all that God has richly supplied what we need. Life will have plenty of challenges and difficulties, but we shouldn't spend time worrying about what might go wrong. Instead, we should spend time enjoying the days that you and I have. God has given us these things freely. This is why Jesus taught us to pray in this way. Matthew chapter 6, verse 9 through 13. We were very well known in verse with this, uh, this prayer. Pray like this. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive our debtors as we forgive. Um, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from all evil. You see, the days of our lives are not meaningless, church. We are just unable to fully comprehend them all. This is why we need our daily bread, our daily portion. May the Lord be your portion today. Every single day you live, He will provide what you need every day all the time. Amen? We are to not give up on seeking God. We must be content in not knowing everything, but instead recognize that every breath is a gift from Him. And that we should honor him in all we do. Every morning that you and I wake up, we should acknowledge that he alone is our life and our portion in Christ Jesus. And that he will give us what we need. No matter what we must go through in life, life is a beautiful gift that Yahweh has provided. Then, I, then we have this statement. I shouldn't have spoke too soon. Lou, I'm sorry, man. Still got a little bit of time though. <laughs> then I saw all the work of God. I'm going to end soon, you guys. Then I saw the, the work of God that man cannot find out the work that is done under the sun. Okay. This here is the unhealthy obsession that people have who don't know Jesus Christ as their savior. I say that because when you don't have peace with God, 
there's a restlessness about yourself that you just quite you can't quite quench. You don't know what it is, but there's a restlessness. An example, some people try to quiet this restlessness with travel. Nothing wrong with travel. Nothing at all wrong with travel. If you can afford it, please do. Go abroad. Go travel. Explore this wonderful, beautiful world that God has created. But some of these people that don't know Christ, they will go to the most exotic locations on the face of the earth in search of fulfillment. But still, there is no lasting peace found. I told you guys a while back about my coworker, um, and I'm not trying to bust this person out. It's just a real life example. They went to Hawaii. They went to Hawaii. Everybody knows you go to Hawaii, you're having a good time, right? They went to Hawaii. They could not sleep. They were miserable. So much anxiety, so much fear, so much stress over the circumstances there. You're in Hawaii, man. You can see your feet in the water. Go get you a pokeball and go chill, man. Go to this corner to have them chop you up a coconut, put the straw in there and just go eat, just drink, chill. They couldn't do it. It's so sad. I've been blessed. Every time I've gone to Hawaii, I've had a blast, man. <laughs> I've had, I'm, not, I'm not trying to boast. I'm just saying I've, I've had a good time. I've been able to enjoy it, and I slept like a baby. <laughs> slept like a baby, man, and I don't sleep. Every, people that know me, I wake up at the crack of dawn. <sighs> Crazy. Others, they try to drown out restlessness by accomplishing much. Busy bodies. They spend their lives accumulating many accolades and prestigious awards. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. Achieve your achievements. <laughs> At first, it's a certain high they get from accomplishing a goal. Again, nothing wrong with that. Live a productive life. It would be bad if you were lazy. <laughs> Live a productive life. But as they age with every new accomplishment they get, they begin to realize there is no lasting joy in being honored before men. Remember what Jesus said to the Pharisees, I'm praying on the corner. That's all the praise you're going to get, man, from these people looking at you. You're looking in the wrong way for things. You see, here in our text, you have those who are obsessed with trying to figure out why all things happen to happen under the sun. It starts out with a genuine wonder that grows into an unhealthy obsession trying to unlock every mystery of life. The Bible is clear that there are, there, there are simply some things we cannot understand completely here on earth. And many things that Yahweh just chooses not to disclose to us. Job chapter 11 verse 7 to 8 tells us this. Can you find out the deep things of God? Can you find out the limit of the Almighty? It is higher than heaven. What can you do? Deeper than Shiloh. What can you know? And I'll end with this. Um, Isaiah and Michelle can come up. There are three things that are mysteries in Christian theology. The Trinity, the Incarnation, and the Atonement. The first is this. The mystery of the Trinity is how the three persons, God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit are one in God. <laughs> like, try to figure that one out. <laughs> Rack your mind, man, because you'll never figure that out. <laughs> The second is this, the mystery of the incarnation is how the divine nature is united to human nature in the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. How does that work? Huh? You go seminary all you want. How are you going to figure that one out? Third is this, the mystery of the atonement of how the holiness of God can be reconciled with unholy sinners like you and me so that we can be brought back home to God. You see, no one can understand the mysteries of God but we can walk in faith and take God at his word. Amen. This is why you and I must live in contentment with the things of God. All that he has revealed to us in his son, Jesus, who is the Messiah. When we are content and busily living out the life that father God has given us in his son, we will be consumed with him. Not stressing out trying to uncover mysteries of God that we shouldn't be so concerned with. Rather, we will be more concerned about walking in obedience to the call that he has placed on our lives. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word that is not hindered by man. 
is not hindered by the things of the world, but you give us absolute truth. You show us who you are. You reveal your great authority to us. You show us how much you love us with your mercy and your grace. And Father, we are so thankful that you love us so. May we receive your love. May we put down our pride and just simply receive the hug that you have for us. You want to comfort us. You want to encourage us. You want to challenge us to do better, to trust in you, to put our faith wholeheartedly in you. So today, Father, would you do a supernatural work, a miracle in the lives of your people, that you would awaken us from the dead and that we would have true life and true life in you. Father, I thank you and I praise you. In the glorious, wonderful name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen.